Hi, everyone. This is Kathleen. Um, I was just talking, but I, I'm assuming I was muted, so I'll repeat what I was saying. Diane, thank you so much for um, a really, really fascinating presentation. Um, I'm still thinking about it. It's almost hard to formulate questions about it because the material is so sophisticated, so to really like chew through um, or, or um, make explicit the kind of wonderings that I'm having, and I'm sure other people are, I think it's a testament to um, how great the presentation was. Um, and it's a nice compliment to the earlier ones this afternoon, which were much more um, practical and hands-on and looking at um, application and how might one um, identify tools for tracking implementation, whereas you're providing a nice um, counterpoint to thinking through what needs to be measured or what are these processes that we're trying to get at with the tools that we might <coughs> um, glean from the Libre project and um, the Rehabilitation Measures database. Um, so just to start a little more formally then, I, I think in case anyone is just joining now, I'm Kathleen Murphy. I direct the Center on Knowledge Translation for Disability and Rehabilitation Research. Um, and I want to introduce the other people who are with me on the phone. Uh, Mark Harness is Clinical Associate Professor of Rehabilitation Medicine at the University of Washington. Do you want to say hi, Mark? Hey there. Can you hear um, me? Yes. Can everyone? Yep. Um, okay, you might great. want to speak a little more loudly. And um, just while we're talking about volume, um, my own voice is a little weak today. So I will keep an eye on that presenter chat in case I need to speak up myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I suggest other people on the phone do that as well. Um, Margaret Nozick. Um, Margaret, I'm assuming you want us to call you Peg, as we're yeah. used to doing those who know you. OK. Um, yes. Margaret Pegg is a professor um, at the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the Baylor College of Medicine and director of the Center for Research on Women with Disabilities, which people also call CROWD. So Peg, you were starting to say hi. You want to um, finish introducing yes, yourself? Hi. Howdy, howdy, go Astro. Great. Thank you. And. Um, the third respondent with us today is Arielle Silverman. Um, she is a disabilities research and training consultant and runs her own firm, Disability Wisdom Consulting. Are you with us, Arielle? I am. Hello, everyone. Great. Thanks so much, all three of you. Um, I hope you've gotten a lot out of the presentations today, and we're really looking forward to hearing your ideas about them. Um, so to kind of warm up the crowd and get people besides um, the handful that have been using the chat, a little you know, um, opportunity to use that and get comfortable with it. We're going to do a couple of polls. So um, the first one is, um, which aspects below re relate most to your work? Choose one. Knowledge creation, inquiry, synthesis, tool or product development, um, or the action cycle, designing and tracking KT strategy, implementation, and impact, or does your work really um, include both aspects, or really it's just, you know, you, you do something else? Um, if you'll remember, these um, two aspects were presented in um, Diane's presentation. It's a, it was the, the graph that had um, the knowledge to action model with the triangle in the middle with the inquiry synthesis and tool product development, and then the action cycle going around um, describing how you would promote use of what knowledge has been created. Um, so while people are working on that poll, in case some of you are just joining us, um, I wanted to introduce the presenters who are still with us on the phone. So I know, Diane, you said you were going to um, stay with us on the line, right? You're with us? I'm here, and I'll stay. OK, great. Is there anyone still with us from the Libre Project or who's phoned back in? Uh, yes, Mary Slavin. Great. Thanks so much, Mary. And um, Alan Heineman or Linda Ehrlich, are you with us? We are both here. Wonderful. Thanks so much. That's great. So I'm sure there'll be questions for both of y'all as well as Diane. Um, all right, so let's just kind of look at our poll results. Um, looks like. Um, over half of you consider that your work involves both aspects, and then 
um, one in five are um, focused primarily on knowledge creation or the action cycle. Um, looking over, there were no other comments. Okay. Um, so let's pull that one, pull down and pull up another one, which is um, in which disability-related domain do you do most of your work? Would it be employment, participation in community living, health and function, technology, or something else? Um, so NIDLA grantees who are with us, you will recognize um, these categories as the priority areas that um, NIDLA funds. Um, so I just thought I'd explain that to you. We, we, I know we have a lot of people from outside the NIDLA community with us today, so that's where those categories came from. Okay, so this is kind of not surprising that um, about half of the people who chose to participate in the poll, or more than half now, um, come from the health and function um, area. Um, since all three of our presenters, and in some sense, a lot of the KT work itself comes out of that arena. Um, okay, so let's move on from the poll. Um, but I, given that that result, I would ask our presenters, since we're not all on the, involved here today from a health and function um, background, that we might want to attend to thinking through um, how the work that we're talking about applies to um, employment or participation in community living or other fields outside of health. Uh, OK, um, so the questions that we had asked Mark and Peg and Ariel to think about ahead of time um, are pretty generic. And what we're going to try to do is um, link back our discussion to the theme um, for today, which um, Mark Karn has just, you just started to do that in your question to Diane about what, is, what are the implications if we're thinking about complex systems for tools for tracking and implementation. Um, so the first question is, how does tracking implementation relate to NIDLR grantees and their research findings? So given that this is um, a conference sponsored by the Center on Knowledge Translation specifically for disability and rehabilitation research, um, are there specific ways that we can connect tracking implementation or raise concerns about it in relation to being a NIDLA grantee or a disability-oriented researcher? Um, Ariel, do you want to start? Um, well, I don't know how much this relates to tracking implementation, but I'm just thinking in general about the three presentations and how they're connected and some of the common themes that came up um, between the three presentations. And I think one of the things that struck me the most is the fact that KT needs to be iterative and not just kind of a process, like a linear process where somebody does a study and publishes the results, and then the results get dis disseminated to the broader community. But instead, it's an iterative process where stakeholders are brought in at the beginning, um, like thinking about how the Libre project was conducted, where burn survivors and clinicians were brought in at the very beginning of the project to raise research questions and identify problem areas, and then kind of move down to um, developing specific scale items, and then the measure was developed by the research team, and data were collected, again, with collaboration from the community, and then results were disseminated to the community. So this iterative process, I think, is really critical um, in determining that there's back and forth between the researchers and the um, members of the broader stakeholder community. Um, and then I think that also relates to Diane's concept of complexity and that there's not just a linear relationship. It's really important to have those perspectives kind of intertwined in a reciprocal way. So Diane here, I, I would say, I, I mean, I completely agree with that notion of uh, the iterative nature, and you can't you can't wait till you have some results. And as we used to say in my office, throw them over the fence to the people who you think want to pick it up and read it. You have to be 
uh, working across that fence uh, and with people uh, all along. One interesting cautionary note, though, in terms of um, unintended consequences uh, would, could be if you work with stakeholders and or people affected by a disability, uh, prior to um, getting resources for uh, doing a project and that process that you're undertaking is to say, for example, figure out what the intervention is actually going to be and the metrics, um, and then you apply for the grant and you don't get it. You have a, a potential challenge there with the individuals who aren't used to the grant life of an academic and the fact that we get, if we're lucky, you know, 10% of what we apply for, that kind of uh, circumstance, people can be uh, quite disappointed. So I think that's one cautionary tale about that. And then the other cautionary tale, which is kind of the opposite uh, approach, is uh, writing. Well, I've, I sat on a grants panel recently where a number of the applications said, we are going to co-develop and co-produce the metrics and the intervention that we uh, undertake in this particular domain. And then the grant review committee has the challenge of figuring out whether or not that's a good project when they don't really have the project well defined yet. And they're not used to that kind of a problem. That, and, the, and you might get compared to other projects where things are well defined. So I think moving towards an iterative process will also require um, some of our cultures and systems to change as well, because they're not really set up to manage in, in that kind of a context. This is, this is Mark and Diane. I think that makes that makes so much sense, and it is a big part of the challenge. I, I realized as we were as we were as I was listening to the presentations and thinking about some of the questions that um, had been posed that that I I've ended up a little confused about what we mean by what what, what kind of implementation we're talking about. And I think your inter, intervention level framework helps um, quite a bit because I think a lot of the implementation that that I had in my mind was really at that level of structural elements. And so, you know, thinking about implement, tracking implementation being things like looking at fidelity of implementation or looking at unexpected adaptations to the interventions that we've developed or taking it beyond that maybe to up to the level of goals to looking at outcomes. Um, and, and obviously the first two presentations dealt a lot with measures of, of outcomes. And so I think that that, that um, kind of being able to think at, at which levels of, of that intervention level framework we're thinking about as it relates to implementation uh, is important. And, and I do agree that, that we have a, especially in the kind of grant writing culture and review culture, we, we really want to see that you very clearly know all the structural elements and all the pieces and you have it all put together. And so um, allowing for iterative and reflective design to happen in a project, it, it can be challenging to write those grants and to get them funded. Yes. Uh, let me just add, your, your initial comment is uh, right on. Um, we did, we've got a couple of publications out there. The one I think that's listed uh, under the un intervention level framework slide actually used the framework to uh, look at uh, strategies for addressing obesity. And I think it was actually childhood obesity in that particular paper. And so we took all of the recommendations for implementation or things to implement and sorted them by the framework. And what you find almost every time you do this is that the vast majority of the things that we're thinking about doing are at the structural element level. And we rarely think, we rarely think about feedback loops and delays as a strategy for change. Uh, and certainly as we go up the food chain uh, and get to paradigms, we're rarely thinking about that as a strategy. And it's not surprising because of the, the evidence-based medicine paradigm culture that we're in and the fact that it's pretty tough to get empirical evidence as it relates to ha what happens if we shift the goals of the system or we attempt to uh, make a change in the, um, the, the deeply held beliefs. Those are, I think those are incredibly important areas, but we, we don't study them very well. And I do think, in particular, the, the really underexploited one is around feedback loops and delays. We, we don't usually think about strategies that are in those domains, and yet 
if we look at systems and we think about the interconnections and we think about interrupting or adding interconnections, we, we may have more effective approaches to uh, intervention than if we're just circling in on one of those variables. Peg, did you want to um, bring anything up in the conversation? Now, I know you have a long, long career of um, trying to get a lot of things done, including, I think, reducing obesity, right? Yeah. Yes, actually, that was very interesting to, to hear Dr. Feingold, uh comments about that model. You know, we've looked at that model, and we have tried to add elements that are very specific to people with um, with disabilities, including medication, um, how disability characteristics uh, affect it, which may affect even the engine itself, some people who have a metabolic element to their disability. And also, we try to add environmental barriers, and it doesn't fit. You know, it doesn't fit. And, and it's really hard to get anybody interested in this. <laughs> I mean, just based on the number of rejections, which is far greater than 90%, I mean, people don't seem to really care that, you know, disability has a huge effect on obesity. So that model needs to be changed. And I'm not sure how we, as researchers from the rehabilitation field, could have the power to get them to listen to us. Yeah. Right, Peg, um, which model are you referring to? The, the obesity um, mapper, the one that came out of the UK. Got the it. one that looks like spaghetti. Spaghetti and meatball diagram, I like to refer to it. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Exactly. Because maybe that's the next question is how can we move from our critique of what is already out there to getting them to change the model and use that uh, in policy ways as well. I guess my reaction to that is um, uh, don't, don't try to change the model. Build your own model for your own purposes. So what is it you're trying to achieve? And if it's an understanding of how disability intersects with um, uh, variables that are also in the environment or related to the individual, then, then what you need to do is go about building your own conceptual model. I think of that as a conceptual model or just a heuristic. I don't really care, honestly, about those interdependencies. You can't really use that map beyond as a, well, I, I think the main tool that it presents is a, a a, a tool for discussion and for engagement. And when we zoomed out of it and saw that nobody really thought food, food consumption was driven by food production, it initiated a conversation or it was fed into a conversation. So I think I would think carefully about what the goal is and then construct your own heuristic. And it may not be, it may be causal loop diagram is the right way to go, but there may be other forms of heuristic that are actually more important. like. I'm wondering if you're thinking about um, how disability affects uh, uh, an individual's paradigm. What, what, what would be the things um, as it relates to the intervention level framework that are important? It might be that a different frame is, is more valuable to you. Well, that's, that's good advice. Um, yeah, because disability changes everything. Physical mm -hmm. activity, the kinds of foods you have access to, the way you digest food. And so I think what we're talking about is creating another layer on top of that particular model where these elements that we have to, or we as people with disabilities have to live with every day and how it radically changes the balance in that model. Yeah, it's also really important to remember what um, uh, one of the, with the guys, the originators in this area said, all models are wrong, some are useful. <laughs> and, and as we said here, you know, the model is really just one articulation, and it's the people who, in a sense, were in the room. So I think it sounds like you, you don't want to think about it as building on, but as creating 
a novel tool for the purposes that you have in mind? And if I can change this uh, whole issue to one more level, um, your whole presentation made me realize that I think in rehabilitation and in the broad field of health promotion research, we tend to apply simple solutions to complex problems. Hmm. That what's really going on out there is closer to chaos. <laughs> you know, with, with different people, different researchers, different institutions just taking on their own approach. And it could be simple, it could be complex. But what they're doing, I mean, it could be complicated, but what they're really dealing with is a very, very complex, uh, what, complex situation. You can't just prescribe physical exercise, in other words. And to go back to obesity, you can't just treat obesity with physical activity because there are so many other elements, the psychological, the social pressures, the logistical issues, the, the um, environmental barriers are paramount, paramount for us. Mm. So it's so complex. I get really irritated at interventions that do nothing but look at physical activity. So I totally agree with you that um, uh, that we do too many simple things and think they're going to solve a problem in their one little structural element. But I, I will just make the comment that I think sometimes when, when, when I think about this and I look at the slide on solutions to complex problems, some of those ideas in there, like building trust, albeit not really simple, is, is a simple concept for tackling that problem. It feels distant for some people, but actually it could be a very effective approach. So um, not all of the solutions that are appropriate for complex problems are complex in and of themselves. That's a kind of hopeful <laughs> observation. <laughs> um, I'm noting Martina Rose has the comment, looking for heuristics triggers in my mind the need to understand underlying mechanism of the intervention slash translation slash implementation than just looking for, quote, easy observable components. So, you know, there's clearly a tension here between being aware of the spaghetti and meatballs of anything we're looking at, but also wanting to bite off something that's measurable and we can, you know, how can one researcher or research project intervene within that network of um, phenomena? So yeah. um, I don't know if, you know, mm -hmm, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was, this is Mark. I, it, it kind of, it's a question I've been thinking about as we've been talking and, and Diane, maybe you could respond to it. it uh, are simple and complicated systems sometimes part of complex systems? Can researchers, can researchers who are going to, you know, have to write grant proposals that are relatively constrained, can they cut off chunks of a complex system to work on, or or is it really something that has to be done more holistically? I guess what I would say is. Um, that um, absolutely systems are made up of systems are made up of systems. And uh, it all depends on how you want to draw the boundary, boundaries for the system and its interaction with its environment. So defining boundaries is actually a fairly important part of thinking about a system. Uh, so absolutely, uh, it's feasible to do that, and it may be necessary for researchers who are working in a system that still believes in reductionist science. But what I would argue is that you'll benefit from always thinking about what you're doing in the context of the whole, whole system in a more integrated way. In other words, don't lose sight of the fact that there are the, you, there are, you've defined the boundaries in some way. There are interactions between that system and other systems. And, and as you think about the results, it's in an integrated way that uh, they become more powerful. So mm -hmm. I think that's part of the dance that we might need to do as researchers to get uh, things moving in the right direction. I also personally really want to see people start using some of these ideas to develop um, you know, the empirical evidence that 
policymakers would say a systems approach to intervention actually has proven to be better. There's not a lot out there like that. There's, there are a couple of studies which have used um, the principles of complexity in doing a synthesis of other studies. So one really interesting study looked at interventions for type 2 diabetes. And they rated the, the group of papers that fit their criteria. I think there were about 30 papers, but I'm not necessarily remembering that correctly. Where they, they just took the papers, one, rater, uh, one, one axis of rating was how many of these four different aspects of complexity did they consider or were embodied in the intervention that they attempted. And then a different person rated them for their um, uh, success in a kind of a very simple 0 uh, 0.51 scale. But they found actually quite a good correlation between uh, the number of aspects of complexity that were considered and the success of the intervention. And I think that's a really important uh, learning, and it helps us develop the evidence that's necessary to sort of drive us in the direction of using systems thinking in, in the way we do interventions and the way we think about them. Now, interestingly enough, I just came from a conference on complexity in healthcare in which I heard uh, a preliminary presentation of using that same methodology to look at traumatic brain injury. And they didn't find a correlation, but it's, it seems likely that the lack of correlation in the traumatic brain injury case comes from the incredible variability within and between studies trying to intervene as it relates to traumatic, traumatic brain injury. The injuries are always, there's a lot of variability. I, you guys are the experts in disability, but my understanding is there's tremendous variability within and between studies, which could make a synthesis of that sort quite difficult to do. I'll stop there. So I'm thinking, Ms. Kathleen, um, you know, it's, I'm thinking of a telescope and, you know, your presentation, Diane, I'm looking at all the stars and thinking about the entire universe. And then if you think also, well, there's also a microscope and the Libre project, you know, if we're going to measure anything, then there's incredible complexity in, you know, wherever we look, if you're going to be careful enough about the measure that you're developing. So Mary, I don't know if you had any thoughts or reactions or comments as you're listening to this? Um, from the microscopic level, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, when, when we think about the Libre project, we are looking at, I, I, I wouldn't say microscopic as, as much as a you know, very specific focus. And um, right. in that yeah. focus, it's not looking small. It's looking at, at something that, you know, when, when you think about the complex problems, you have to start somewhere. And picking a somewhere to start that is known to be fruitful, because the people who um, are living with burn injury tell you that that's a fruitful place to start. Um, I think then we can begin to um, direct research activities into areas that are going to inform the larger picture, even though we are looking at just a small a smaller issue, which would be social participation. And, you know, I, I find, um, you know, I've been a clinician in rehab for many years and also a researcher and professor. And the thing that we're missing so much is the measurement piece and being able to look at, you know, what we do and how we affect lives in a meaningful way. And I, I would maintain that the Libre is really offering us an opportunity to look at what occurs during the recovery process and, and allows us to figure out how to intervene in meaningful ways that, you know, it might not be the whole picture, but it's an important piece of the picture. Yeah. I mean, I guess I was just thinking, like, detail, right? So if we're going to look at one data point on the spaghetti and meatballs, that, that is what you all did, you know, so here it is the experience of the individual in burn and the types of outcomes that should be measured and as important to that. Well, it, it gives you a data point. So in that, in that sense, yes, it is a very specific point, but it relates to um, something that would be very hard to talk about without a data point. And, and I, I think that's... And even now thinking like about a multiverse, you know, to use the, the metaphor again of like... Yeah. 
Um, so that within every you know thing that we're looking at in the spaghetti and meatballs, there are their own incredible complexities, and which right, ironically right. Too, that's how you get at the paradigm of and Diana and your diagram of thinking about. I think going uh, back and forth between the looking at the you know the small here's your score on the Libre profile social participation scale, and then how that fits into the larger world that you live in, which is why is so social participation difficult for people with brain injury? And when we spoke with the people with brain injury, you know, they, they agreed that it was um, partly their issue as well as the environment they're in. So they definitely had some opinions on um, how important it is to change the environment that they're in, but also um, you know, every, every person that we spoke with talked about this sort of epiphany that they had where they decided, they made a decision to become more engaged. And then you know, we'll be able to learn a lot more about what happens during that process by having that one data point of this is where this person is and why are they there and where are other people who are at a similar time post uh, burn injury, where are they, and, and helping them to move along the continuum and find out what are some of the strategies to help people um, achieve a, a good outcome. Sure. And um, Alan or Linda, um, I'm thinking about you know, the inventory in, of measures in your database. Um, how much do they vary in scope you know, as far as what they measure? Do you have a sense of that? Um, this is Linda. Um, there's a wide variety. I mean, we do have performance measures. We do have patient reported outcomes as well. Um, you know, as we mentioned earlier, there's over 400 instruments right now, but, you know, I, I don't know that I could give you a, a catalog. Sure. And, it, you know, it's obviously, we appreciate having the URL, so whatever, how much of a big of a chunk, as Mark was suggesting, that one wants to, um, or how we want to bound what we're looking at, there, there would be a number of measures potentially in your database that would be of use. Yes, and, and I, I, I think I neglected to say earlier, I mean, you can do a search looking without knowing what instrument you're looking for, and there's several filters that you can use that will help you narrow down, you know, to the population, uh, whether or not the instrument is free, um, if there's certain body parts or, or certain areas that you know you you want to narrow it down to, so you you can come up then with a list that will um, be some things that are somewhat similar. Okay. Um. Um, this is Peg. I have a, a, a comment, please. Sure. Okay. Um, I, I would like to bring up the issue of trust again. Um, simply because I see um, a lot of that, uh, what, what you call it, congenial hypocrisy? Oh, cordial <laughs> hypocrisy, yes. Cordial, as in cordial hypocrisy. I see a lot, a lot of people um, go into therapy or go into the rehab program and they'll nod their head and say, oh, yes, I'll do that. Oh, oh yes, I'll, I'll do all these things you're recommending to speed up my recovery. And they go home and they don't do it. So is that, uh, I mean, you can see this in the utilization rates for assistive technology. They have all kinds of data showing uh, uptake, you know, how much they really do use the device that they're prescribed. So does trust have a role there? If, if we could improve trust in between the um, consumers and the researchers or, or clinicians, would that improve the compliance? And you're saying yes. I, I think if I understood your chart correctly, um, Dr. Feynman, um, but how? how? How can you, what, what are interventions for that trust factor? So, um, uh, really good question, which I'm not sure I can answer, but let me think, think it through a little bit and ask, what, what do we know about why the, there's so much cordial hypocrisy and people are not, you know, they might be polite, but they're really not ever planning to do what uh, is being 
uh, recommended to them. I, I don't know whether trust is a factor there, but that would be the place to start to find out if lack of trust is part of the situation. Um, in terms of interventions to build trust, um, uh, one of them would be around, um, you know, repeated engagement and opportunities uh, to share and learn from each other. I suspect our uh, indigenous colleagues here in Canada would argue understanding where a person comes from like their family. So often in uh, engaging with indigenous communities here, the first place you start is talking about your family and where you come from and who were your uh, grandparents and your grandfathers and things like that. So understanding a person's story is a, is a first step to uh, building, uh, building trust in really disparate communities. Understanding, I, I actually convened um, a workshop, uh, several workshops a number of years ago that were titled uh, Building Trust to Address Obesity. And we found a few really interesting things in the dialogue there. Um, one is that within sector trust actually is harder to build than between sector trust. So here we were talking about academics, NGOs, government, and um, not-for-profits, or uh, and uh, for-profit industry. And in each of those, actually working with others in your sector is actually more difficult than working across sectors. So across sectors, the challenge is understanding that people are coming from different places. Within sectors, you're actually competitors. So this is going a little away from your question about the client-practitioner relationship, but uh, maybe following up and going to look more deeply at the study that I, I presented about where trust matters uh, would give you some clues about where the patient-provider uh, trust uh, factors could be built. And um, when you reduce, uh, the, when you build trust, you absolutely reduce uh, the complexity of operation and what you're doing, uh, and you're more likely to get the kind of engagement from the individual that you want. Understanding where they're coming from, for me, would be a really important component. Um, and we can't make assumptions based on age, demographics, you know, gender, et cetera, et cetera. I'll just give you one other quick story. I know we're just about out of time. Okay. but I'm sorry, Diane. We only have 30 seconds left. Okay, I'll so, stop. Um, yeah, I'll stop. I think we're going to have to um, hold on that story and wrap things up. Um, and I do just want to um, give a big thanks to the other presenters that have joined us um, today and invite everyone to join us on Friday. Um, we'll be here during the same hours, 1 to 5, and our theme for the day is Strategies for Measuring Impact. Um, we will have David Goff from the Epi Center, Mark Kerrigan, uh, digital sociologist talking about social media for academics, and Melanie Barwick will give a presentation on KT planning. Um, so thanks in between. Uh, if you want to check out our KT Expo, feel free. And otherwise, we will see you on Friday.